Love is defined by our actions. It is the fuel that forgives. It is the joy that binds us together. It is the impetus to lend a hand. It is the power that brings us to our knees. Love is the greatest commandment. Well, Sherry and I have had the privilege of raising three boys. And even though our little boys are now in their 30s, uh, that's still part of our lives, is walking with them. And so one of the things that we discovered as we were raising our boys when they were younger and into their you know, early teen years is we, we learned about video games. It wasn't something that was a real big part of our home, but our, our boys, kind of, that was kind of part of boys' lives. And so um, we learned about video games. We got to watch them and cheer them on, sometimes playing video games. We got to play some video games along with them when they wanted us to learn to play with them. And so um, what I, I kind of learned that there's a a theme in a lot of video games where, where the person with the controller is in a battle and they're battling against some kind of, you know, some, someone, and, and then when they win that battle, it's not over. There's like a next battle and that, that one's a little bit tougher. And then when that's over, it's not over, there's like another battle. And whether they're, you know, fighting or have swords or they're making large uh, fireballs and throwing them and things or, you know, whatever it is, it's like there's these battles. And then, and then my boys would explain that eventually the term they used was you get to the ending bad guy who was like the, fi- the final, you know. And so, so, here, so here's some different, some of these might be, if you, if you say, I have no idea what that, that is. This, is, this is creeping me out, this is church, stop it. You're probably not a video game person. Uh, if you're like, I know who all of those are, and I can tell you 10 more, then you're, in, you're into that world. But, but, but here's what we learned as, as parents. That there's sort of that, that journey of battle after battle after battle. Why do I share that with you? Because in Matthew chapter 22, that we're going to be looking at today, it's exactly what's going on. Now, there's not big creatures, but there's enemies coming against Jesus. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew 22. I'll read, I'll read and we'll put it on the screen as part of it. But I want to give you kind of the setting. Um, I will often say that every text has a context. Every text of the Bible has a place it sits in the Bible, a place it sits in history, and to understand what's going on in the text of the Bible, you have to understand what's happening before and after it in the Bible, and what's happening in the world at that time, and sort of in God's salvation history and what God is doing. And so in Matthew 22, you actually have Jesus going through a series of four battles. Battle, and after one battle, a tougher enemy comes, and he fights that battle, and he wins that battle, and another enemy comes, and he's kind of fighting battle after battle after battle. You'll see as I unfold this for you. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along. If you don't, just listen. We'll put the the third battle up on the screen for you, but here's the first two battles. Jesus is doing his ministry. He's bringing in the kingdom. He's serving people, caring for people, and then in Matthew 22, verses 15 through 22, is the first battle, and it really is a battle. The enemy coming against Jesus at this point are called the Pharisees. The Pharisees were very devout, very religious. They knew the Old Testament, like top to bottom, beginning to end. I mean, they were brilliant minds, and they did not like Jesus. So they they came with this first battle, asking him a question that they were hoping would cause him to trip and stumble. Here was their goal. Either discredit Jesus in front of the crowds, because they didn't like the fact that the crowds liked him. So discredit Jesus or get the Roman government angry enough at him to throw him in jail, or maybe have him killed. It was a serious battle. So here's what's going on in in Matthew 22, verses 15 through 22. Read this later today. Read these four battles. It'll, It'll amaze you how it all unfolds. But I'll give you a little snapshot. It begins in verse 15 with these words. This will be on the screens. Just listen. Then the Pharisees, these religious leaders, went out and laid plans to trap Jesus in his words. What's their goal? Trap him, catch him up, create problems. So they sent some people to him and they said, Jesus, you're a rabbi and you're a teacher. So we just have a question for you. Should we pay taxes? Should we pay taxes to Caesar? Just a little question, we're just kind of wondering. What's the the problem with that question? If Jesus says, no, don't pay taxes to Caesar, who's he in trouble with? Rome. Rome. The government's coming after him. If Jesus says, yes, do pay taxes to Caesar, who is Jesus in trouble with? The Jewish community, because they felt oppressed by the Romans, and they were wanting to kind of shake them off and fight against them. So they're asking this question. It's called the proverbial rock in a hard place. They're trying to trap Jesus. Jesus makes this giant fireball, throws it at them, and they blow up. No, that's not what happens. But, but, but read the passage. 
Because Jesus, it's, it's, just, it's just a slap down. He beats them. He deals with them. And then, but, but just like in a video game, then right after that, there's the next battle. So here's what happens. Then in verses 23 and following is the next battle. And here's what you read in verse 23. Right after Jesus deals with this first battle that went on. It says, that same day, the Sadducees, another very strong, influential religious group, the Sadducees, who say there's no resurrection, came to Jesus with a question. And they bring this whole scenario, this convoluted, complicated, theological scenario, and they say, Jesus, if a person dies, and you know, they've had this marriage, and another marriage, and another marriage, and then in the resurrection, what? and they didn't even believe in the resurrection. But they create this whole scenario. Why? Why did they do this? Why did the Sadducees do this? Because they wanted to trap Jesus. They wanted to nail him. They wanted him dead or locked up or at least discredited in front of the crowds. So they, they throw their next battle at him. Jesus just, he takes this laser sword and he goes, zzz, zzz, zzz. no, he doesn't. But Jesus just deals with them. Victory number two. So now the battle ends. No. Battle number three. That's the one we're going to look at together. So if you have your Bibles, uh, follow along. It'll be on the screens as well at home and on, and on campus. Look at verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees. This is just, this is right, this like battle after battle. So hearing that, the, 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 uh, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees, they're coming back for their next round to battle again. The Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law. Now they're bringing in like their, what my boys call the ending bad guy, the, you know, the boss, the, the toughest one, right? So, so uh, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? They're not asking because they want to learn. They're asking because they want to trip Jesus up. There's lots of commandments in the law, lots of commandments in the prophets. And depending on how he answered, they might be able to twist it, manipulate it, use it against him, and tear Jesus down. But Jesus just, Jesus just goes right to the heart. So, that, so they say to Jesus, they ask, you know, they ask Jesus, um, which is the great, you know, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Verse 37, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. All that you are, all that you think, all that you feel, all that you do should be surrounded by loving the Lord your God Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and all the prophets are hang, are built. They hang on these two commandments. Jesus brings it back just to the basics with them. And this becomes the third battle. Now there's a fourth battle after this that Jesus instigates. And when he's done with it, they won't even come and talk to him anymore because he just deals with them. Read it later. If you have your Bibles open, don't read the whole thing right now and study that. Stay with me for the sermon. But read, read, read Matthew 22 later and you're going to see how this, how this goes from battle to battle to battle. But on this one, Jesus says, he just says, let me just bring it down to the most simple terms. Love God with all that you are and then love the people around you. And you know, those are put in order for a reason. This is, we're doing a little two-week series here. This week's called Love God. Next week's called Love People. Because that's what Jesus said. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor, right? And, here's, and I believe that they're in the right order. Because if we don't love God fully and we don't know God's love, we have a hard time loving our neighbor. If you want to know if I can be a good husband to my wife, just watch and see how close I'm walking with Jesus. The more I walk with Jesus, the closer I am to loving God and being loved by God, I can overflow love to my wife. If I'm not... I can be a bit of a problem at times. It's hard for anyone to imagine, but I cannot be always pleasant all the time. But it's my love for God. that motiv how, What makes me a good dad and a good grandpa? It's loving Jesus, walking with Jesus. When his love fills me, it can overflow. That's what makes me a good friend to my friends. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that wonderful of a person unless God's filling me with his love. And when he does, there's good stuff overflowing. Not from me, but from the presence of God through Jesus Christ in my life. So Jesus says to these religious leaders, he says, I'm gonna take you back to the basics. And so he makes it clear to them, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. They brought their top guy. They brought an expert in the law with the Pharisees. Pharisees first couldn't deal with him. The Sadducees couldn't take him down. Battle number three, they come with an expert in the law and the Pharisees and Jesus just answers so perfectly. It shuts them down. It silences them. Now, where's Jesus getting this from? 
If he's got to choose the most important of all the law and all the prophets, well, he's getting it from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now, if, your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, you can turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is, this is a section of the Old Testament called the Shema. Shema was the Hebrew word for hear. Like, listen, pay attention, hear. This was the first passage that Jewish families taught their children to memorize. The first passage. It, it was central to their faith. So when Jesus quotes this scripture... He's quoting something that all of them would recognize. They would all hear it, and they would all understand this is part of the bedrock of their faith. So I'm going to read Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. It'll be on the screens. If you have your Bibles, follow along. But I want you to notice not just what, what God inspires to be written here for how we live our lives if we're going to follow after God, but I want you to notice that after he makes a clear statement, he talks about how it's supposed to fit into our lives. And it's a big deal. It's supposed to connect in our lives in every way. So here's Deuteronomy chapter 4. Uh, Chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. This is where Jesus is quoting from in this third battle against the religious leaders, okay? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We believe in one God. We are monotheistic. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. That's what Jesus is going back to. But watch what comes afterwards. Listen to what comes after and how this is supposed to fit into our lives. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Don't just keep them to yourself. Impress them on your children. Pass them on to the next generation. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, wherever you go, when you lie down and when you get up. There's this faith of ours. It seems like it's supposed to permeate all of our lives. Now, this is where it gets kind of strange for us. We don't understand culturally what's happening, but it says, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. What's the point? He said, said, this is so important to remember that you put little reminders around your house and even on your hand. And some of the Jewish people would actually tie little boxes with scriptures on the back of their hands on their foreheads, literally tie them on there. So it was right there. The point that God is making is keep it on your mind, keep it in your hands, keep it on your door, keep all of your life. The way we live in our faith isn't just like a little side thing you do for an hour once a week. That's not what faith is. It's all of our life, all that we do, all that we are. If we love the Lord our God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so, so this, this was the, the, the first thing that children learned. It was on their minds, it was on their hearts, and Jesus just takes them back to the simple basics. They're coming to trip Jesus up. Boom. They're trying to knock him over. They're coming to get him in trouble. And Jesus says, let's just go to Sunday School 101. Let's just get the basics down. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second commandment is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Everything else ties into these two. Get these two right, and you can make make sense of the rest. That's our invitation today, to get it right to love God first and above all else. So with the time we have left, I want to just think about what does that mean? What does that look like? How do you and how do I take another step along our path of growing to love God? So I want to first think about loving God with our whole heart, with our feelings, our emotions, the passion that moves us. Do you love God with your heart, with passion, with an emotional connection? Now here's what I've learned. I've been a pastor now for, for getting close to 40 years. And I've learned something as a pastor. Different Christians love God in different ways. They, you can love God passionately. Some people are like, well, I love God with my mind. I mean, I love to study the Bible. I know a lot about the Bible. I, I have a lot of answers. I can defend my faith. And they love God with their mind. But some of those folks that really love God with their mind, they're not really into loving God with their heart. Well, I don't really like to sing songs of praise. That's not my way of, I'm more of an intellectual Christian. You can be very intellectual and be a Christian. But, but here's the thing. I think Jesus is saying, love God with all that you are. So if you're here today and you're like, well, I'm more of the, I don't like to sing the songs of praise. I kind of find boring and they don't inspire me. I love to study the scriptures and study theology. Fantastic. But love God with your heart too. Some other people love God with their heart. Oh, I love Jesus. Yes, a song starts, they just begin weeping. Oh, I love Jesus. You know? And it's like, that, they, they, their heart's all there. But they're like, I don't really like to study my Bible. I don't like to really think about my, you know, explain my faith intellectually. Well, I think that God would say to you today, keep loving God with your heart, but learn to love God with your mind. Because we're not just, he doesn't say multiple choice, which of these do you want to love God with? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all that you are. 
So as you listen to these things, you might have something go, but that's how I love God. Great, keep growing that. But listen to some of the other areas that you can grow in loving God and let God inspire you to grow. So loving God with our whole heart, feelings, emotions, passion that moves us. I find even the most intellectual people, they have things that move their heart still. Everyone has a heart. And if you love Jesus, if you love people, there's things that move you. For me, I, my, my approach to my spiritual growth and learning is, is I love to study, I love to read, I love to think. That's, that's a natural way for me to love God. But also I know that God's given me a heart to love him with my heart and with passion. And, and so as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, you know, there are people that I love with a passion. Uh, my, my three sons, this is a picture of my sons from about a year ago, right here, my three little boys. That's my boys, no. Now that's, a, that's a more than three, dec- uh, three decades ago or so, right about there, right? About three decades ago. Um, that, my, my boys, I, I, I would say, I feel like I would die for them. I love them. I delight in them. They're my sons. Now, this is about five or six years ago. They'd grown up a bit. They're even older than that now, more grown up now. But those, they're still my little boys. They're still my guys. I would feel like I'd do anything for them. I love them. I don't just love them intellectually. Everybody follow me? Oh, yes, I I think about thoughts about how I... No, they're my sons. I love them. And then I discovered a new kind of love. I didn't really know. I had people say, oh, man, when you hit the season of your life, your heart's going to open up in a whole new way. But I didn't have this until a few years ago. And now grandkids. So I want you to to see. So the the, the, the boy right there, that, that is Cohen Whitaker. And then the little girl on the right there with the strawberries, that is Piper Joy. And that's Isla Grace uh, in Cohen, on Cohen's lap there. And then in Idaho is another one of our grandkids, and that is Kel Ryan. I love those kids. Not just intellectually. You following me? There's a love here. And God says, love me with your heart. Fall more in love with me. I've heard intellectuals say, oh, I can't stand these new worship songs. They're like, they're, they're just like it's supposed to be some kind of love song to God or, or love song to Jesus. I want to say, get over your intellectual arrogance and get on your knees and worship a little bit, you know? Don't criticize people who love God passionately from the heart. As a matter of fact, why don't you let your heart engage a little bit more in your worship and your praise? Love God with your heart. Let, let there be an emotional response. I remember as a, as a young Christian, there was a song, uh, I think it was Maranatha Praise that, that came up out of Calvary Chapel down in Costa Mesa. Kind of, you know, this is you know, 70s, 80s. Pre- and there was this one song just taken right from the Bible. It was actually in Middle English still. It was, as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after you. Well, I wasn't somebody who, I was a surf kid. I talk about panteth and longeth. But, <laughs> but when we would sing that song, my heart would just long for God. I wasn't raised to be emotional. I was, my dad was a computer graphics designer. My mom was a math and science teacher. I was, I was raised as an intellectual atheist skeptic. But when I started to understand the love of God, something happened in me. And, and I began to love him back. I love that closing line in the song that Megan sang. Now I get to love you in return. Now I get to love you. God, you've given your life for me. You died on the cross for me. You gave everything for me. Now I get the privilege of loving God back. So we can say, Lord, let let me love you with my heart. There's all kinds of pictures of wholehearted love of believers. Read read in the Psalms. Read David's Psalms where he just, some of the songs he writes inspired by the Holy Spirit are just saying, oh God, how I love you. David was the one who wrote in Psalm 42, as the deer pants for the streams of living water, so my soul longs for you, O Lord my God. He says, when can I get to go be with my God? A longing to be together. It's, it's, it's like a teenager who's fallen in love for the first time and they just, they want to hang around with their boyfriend or girlfriend all the time. I'm just so in love with them. It's like, it's like, it's like there's that, God, I just want to be with you. Would you say, God, let my heart long for you. Refresh that love in me that used to be so deep and now maybe it's grown cold. Read in, in, in the New Testament and the Gospels about Mary. Mary, as she sits at the feet of Jesus. Martha, her sister's rushing around and cooking and cleaning and doing her thing, getting ready for company. But Mary just sits because she wants to be near Jesus. That's a heart in love with Jesus. I keep a book on, on one of my tables in my office called The Prayers of the Martyrs. And this, this book, I actually shared some quotes from this, some prayers from this book a few years ago. And, and Cole, our worship leader, said to me this morning, he saw I had this book and I was gonna read from it. He goes, he goes, man, the last time you mentioned that book, I went and bought it. And he just said to me, he said, that's a hard read. 
Now, interestingly, if you look at this book, look at most of the pages are like, and that easy, easy read, look at just a little a couple pair. I mean, just little things. It's, it's not hard because there's lots of words. It's hard because every prayer in here is something somebody prayed before they were killed because they love Jesus. These are people that were told, deny your faith or you'll die. And they said, then I'll die. That's love. That's love for Jesus. And I was looking through this as I was getting ready for this message, reading some of these. And, and this one, uh, Quirinius of, S- of Sicia was arrested, was tortured, and after being arrested and tortured before they were drowned to death, if they wouldn't deny Jesus, this was their prayer. God, you are with me, and you can help me. You were with me when I was taken, taken by the government. You were with me when I was taken, and you are with me now. You strengthen me. The God I serve is everywhere, in heaven and earth and the sea, but he is above them all. For all live in him. All were created by him. And by him only do they remain. I will worship only the true God. And I will carry in my heart that God. No one on earth shall be able to separate me from him. And then, yeah, amen. Yeah, may that be our prayer. And I hope uh, hope you're never in a place where you have to make that decision. But every prayer in this, every prayer in this book is somebody who said, I love Jesus too much to deny my faith in Jesus. That's a heart in love. That's a heart so in love that that the person says, I'll lay my life down for him. So here's the question. What could ignite your heart with deeper love for God? How How do you let your heart fall more in love with God, connect more with God? And if you're a note taker, write these three things down. If you're not a note taker, just lock these in your, in your memory, okay? So what will help my heart grow deeper in love with God? Here's the first one. Have a great memory. Remember what God has done. Remember his faithfulness. Remember how he's carried you through. And I shared in the first service, after you've been a pastor somewhere for more than a decade, I'm moving towards 14 years of being a pastor here. One of the things that makes pastoring wonderful and a challenge is you know people's stories. You know their joys, you know their heartaches, you know what they've walked through. And, and, and I, I can look around this room and I see people, I, I think, man, if you, I know your story. So just remember, remember when you found out that you had four babies growing in your womb. So well, that wasn't me, but it was Jeannie. Quadruplets. Remember when a whole church gathered around you and said, we love you, you're not in this alone. You got Robert. But, but, but you're going to need more. You've got, you got two sets of arms and you're going to have four babies. And for well over a year, day by day and week by week, the church came around and loved them and walked them through. And now your kids, how old are the, are the kids? Well, you had some, yeah. how, how old are the? 23. 23. A few years have passed since then. We don't have pictures of them. But, uh, but, but, but it's those stories. Remember, remember the seat, you know, but remember God's faithfulness. If you want to grow to love God, remember what he's done for you in the past. Never forget, never forget, never forget. If you want to grow to love God, remember God's character. He is holy, holy, holy. The Lord God Almighty, he deserves your love. He is filled with grace and mercy. He deserves your love. He is, in this unjust, broken world, he is perfect justice and he will one day make things right. He is worthy of your love. Remember his character and love him for who he is. And then just make time to be with him. If you want to grow your heart of love for God, make time to be with him. Slow down and make space. I mean, we fill our lives with all kinds of stuff that just aren't that important. And the one who matters most is available all the time, anywhere. I love that about our God. Anywhere you are, anytime, you pause, you stop, and he's right there with his arms open. So draw near to him and grow your heart of love for him. We love God with our hearts. How about loving God with our words? How we worship, how we praise, uh, how how celebration should erupt naturally in our souls. Um, Are you growing to express your love to God? Man, when you love someone, you say it. When you love someone, you tell them. You you make it known. You tell other people. You know, I, I, I think of my, and I didn't share this in the first, I think of my love for my wife. I'm crazy about my wife. I've known her for over 40 years. We've been married. We're just, just this, and shortly we'll be, and pretty soon we'll be married for 38 years. But I, but my words, what I say about my wife, 
they reflect how I feel about her. I can look at some people around this room. I can, I can ask Tim right here. In all the years, in the 15 years you've known me, how many times have you heard me speak bad about my wife? Never. I love her. And, and if I've got a problem with her, and occasionally we do, um, we have challenges. I'm not gonna go vent it to somebody else, even some of my closest friends. I'm not gonna go complain about my wife because I'm in love with this woman. If I speak about her, I'm gonna speak about how I love her. And there's times with, in my relationship with Jesus, I don't understand everything that happens in this world. It doesn't always make sense to me. But when I speak of my Lord, I speak of the one who died for me, who rose again, and who loves me. Let your words reflect a love for God and speak often of his goodness and his grace. The Bible's filled with pictures of passionate praise. Read the book of Revelation and see all the nations of all the world gathered around the throne, bowing down and declaring, you know, celebrating God's holiness, who he is, his eternal nature, his being. Read the Psalms and hear these, these songs of praise for who our God is. And, and, and just like when you, see, when you see something in life that you really like, that you appreciate, and you go, oh, that's wonderful. I, I heard people the last two days. I heard people, oh, it's so, Monterey's so beautiful. Oh, it's been one of these chamber of commerce kind of couple weekends where it's just been, the temperature's been beautiful, the sky's been blue. And people saying, what a beautiful place. But mostly people that I know have said, but look at what God made. I, I heard one person say yesterday, how can anyone not believe in God when you see something like this? The beauty of where we are. Notice those things, celebrate those things, the beauty of them, but celebrate the God who made them. And then, and then the question, what will help us declare the goodness and the glory of God? What is it that will help you learn to express God's goodness and God's glory? Well, first, notice his presence. You wanna, be, you wanna learn to speak words of God's glory? Just notice he's with you. When? All the time. See, for some people, you, you think of God, well, God shows up, God's waiting at church for me. You know, I show up at church and God's there and I kind of hang out with God for an hour, hour and 10 minutes and then I kind of live the rest of my week. No, no, God is with you all the time, everywhere. Notice his presence and appreciate the fact that he's with you. Appreciate his provision, that God has been good. You know, how much time do we spend? We live in a culture, us particularly who live in, in the United States, we live in a culture that has lots of wonderful good things. But one of our challenges is that we're being told by marketing firms who spend millions of dollars to get inside of our heads, you don't have enough, you need a new one, you need a bigger one, you need an upgraded one. Compared to that person, you don't have very much and we become unappreciative to the God who has lavished us with his goodness. You travel almost anywhere else in the world and just look around at where things are, you, you will come back and say, God, you've been good. But we get spoiled and we get focused on what we don't have. And so learn to just notice God's good gifts. Notice all he's given and appreciate it. I was thinking about this. I was thinking about Sherry and I, before we got married, uh, we negotiated. Because I tell people that are gonna get married, marriage is an ongoing series of negotiations. Um, not very uh, romantic, but it's true. If you can't talk and be open with what you need, you're gonna be in trouble as a married couple. So I said to Sherry, I want to be clear about something. If you marry me, here's one of the things you get. No house. So we'll never own a house. We live in Orange County down in Southern California. She, she said, I want to have a family and I want to, I want to be, stay at home with the kids. I said, great. If we live in Orange County and I'm making a pastor's income and we, and we live there and you're, and you're at home with kids, I said, we will never be able to afford a home. And she agreed. She said, okay. She said, I'll still marry you. So... <laughs> Um, I was better looking back then. But, I, but, but and, and, and then this is a true, true story. I don't know if I ever shared this with all of you. This is true. I said to her, I said, the, here's the other thing. So once she agreed to that, I said, all of our furniture and everything we buy, we have to buy at garage sales. And she said, I will not agree to that. And I said, okay, you can have that one. So you negotiate. But, but I, that, was, that was almost you know, 39 years ago. We, we live in a house. We didn't think we'd ever have a house. And we were okay with that. But God has provided. And we say, thank you, Lord. We didn't need it. And if we hadn't had one, that would have been fine too. We'd have been happy. We were happy when we lived in apartments. We thought we'd live in apartments our whole life. That would have been fine. But God opened the door and allowed us to. God is, God is so good. We've got to pause and just thank him for his goodness and thank him for his provision. And then if you want to grow in, in having a mouth that praises God, focus on his forgiveness. The Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far he will take our sins from us. If you're a Christian, your sins and you 
One of you goes east, one of you goes west, infinitely far away, and they're, they, they're infinitely far away from you. If you're not yet a Christian and you receive Jesus, he takes your sins so far away, they're gone completely forever. That's Jesus. The Bible says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He gave his life while we were still sinners and rebels. He said, I love you so much, I'll die for you. Your mouth begins to express a love for the God who has washed you and made you clean and given you a new life. We love God with our hearts. We love God with our mouths. We love God with our minds, our reason, our devotion. What motivates and drives us, how we think about and see the world. We need to learn to love God with our minds. I'll give you some pictures of intellectual engagement. Sometime, read Psalm 119 in one sitting. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. The whole psalm. It's all about basically saying, oh, how I love the word of God. Oh, how this speaks to my mind. How can a young person keep their way pure by guarding it according to your word? Oh, Lord, how I love your law. I meditate on it day and night, that I fill my mind with it. It changes how I think, how I see the world. There's something about filling our mind with God's truth in a world that says there is no truth or you can make up your own truth. And God says, no, I am the truth and I will speak the truth to you. We need our minds saturated in the word of God. I think of someone like a C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, and I, I love Lewis. I, I've read so many of Lewis's books. I love uh, C.S. Lewis. He's with Jesus now, but he came as a, prof he was a professor of history at Oxford, was not a believer at all, began thinking about things of faith, began asking questions, and gave his heart to Jesus. So he, he was this intellectual whose, whose mind was surrendered to the Lord, but he also wrote children's books. And he had a heart for God. What I realized as I was thinking about this is that, the people I respect the most, the scholars I respect the most, are scholars whose minds are fully engaged in the things of God, but their hearts are deeply in love with Jesus too. You can have all of that because he asks us to love him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. And, and then just uh, think about just an ordinary, an ordinary Christian every day who opens this book and says, Lord, speak to me. Every day, do you know every day of your life you can open this book? It's, it's a book made up of 66 books that span centuries, all inspired by the Holy Spirit. And if you open this book every day and say, Lord, will you teach me something new and speak to my life? God will speak to you. The God of the universe will breathe, bring alive the Holy Spirit. And all of these are God's words, but the Spirit of God brings it alive to our hearts and speaks to our minds and changes our lives. That's why every week of the year, all year long, we put together a reading guide that's on our shoreline app and on the website. Here's a daily reading from the Bible that'll get you ready for next Sunday's sermon. If you don't know where to start in the Bible, pick that up or contact one of our pastors and talk to us and we will help put together a plan for you to read and know the Bible. So how do we engage our mind and our thought life in loving God? How do we truly engage our minds to love the Lord with our minds? Why, as I said already, open the book every day. You want to get your mind in love with God, read the book that God inspired. Ask good questions. Ask, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus and you think, well, I, I, you know, I got all these questions. Hey, the church is a great place to ask those questions. Shoreline's a church where we'll say, listen, bring your questions. We have entire groups that meet just to ask questions about God and talk about it and think about it together and figure out if they really believe and if they can understand who Jesus is. And so keep asking your questions. God's not afraid of your questions. Learn from smart people who love Jesus. I walked through my study and I was looking for uh, examples, and, and I mean, I've got hundreds and hundreds of scholars uh, represented in my library, and what I noticed afterwards, I, I pulled out some of my favorites, and here's what I noticed afterwards. Every one of these scholars is an absolutely brilliant mind, top scholar, who deeply has a heart for Jesus too. And some of the scholars I went by had great intellectual minds, but I don't sense the heart for, of a love for Jesus in their work. This one, Ajith Fernando. Ajith Fernando, he's a pastor who works with students in Sri Lanka. This commentary on Acts is one of the best commentaries. I've, I've, I probably have got 250, 300 commentaries in, in my office. This is the best one by far because he writes as a pastor with a love for Jesus while he deals with the most deep intellectual thoughts you can imagine. He still works with students and, and, and mentors pastors in Sri Lanka in the middle of an incredibly dif difficult time. Uh, Calvin Miller, uh, some of you don't even know that name, but Calvin Miller in the last century is probably one of the most brilliant Christian minds on the planet. Probably, I think Calvin wrote probably 30 or 40 books. When I met him for the first time, sure, I got to meet him at a conference. When I met him for the first time, I'd probably read a dozen of his books. And I told him that, and he said, well, I'd like to write a note for you. And then the next time I saw him, I brought all those books. He wrote a personal note, kind of calligraphy. And everyone, this is a guy who was a poet, a scholar, a local church pastor, probably one of the most brilliant minds the church has had in a long, long time. He's with Jesus now. But 
but this brilliant mind, but a heart deeply in love with Jesus. And it goes on, C.S. Lewis and other scholars, but the, the point is this, find people who, are, who have brilliant minds for Jesus and learn from them. You might get to meet them face to face. You might learn from them from a book or from, from you know, sermons or podcasts or somewhere, but, it, but, but they, lo- they think deeply about faith, but they also love Jesus from the heart. And then finally, loving God with our actions. Surrender, obedience, and a lifestyle that reveals the one we love. You know, loving God with our heart is great. Loving God with our mind is great. Loving God, but, but it should transform our lives. People should be able to look at you. And, and, and even back in Deuteronomy where it says, you know, wear these things, put them on your hands, put them on your foreheads, put them on your doorposts. What's the point? Be so in love with me, walk with me so closely that when somebody looks at you, they notice. There's something different. I don't think you have to tie a box on your hand or you'll look a little odd if you tie a thing on your forehead. It's gonna go, what's that? But, but the idea is someone should look at your life and know that you love Jesus. Think about the different things that people are fans of. People are fans of all kinds of things, right? So right now there's a little, football, there's, there's a little basketball competition going on between a team in the Bay Area here and a team in uh, Boston, right? So who is this person a fan of and who have they devoted themselves to? What team? <laughs> Look closely around that room. It's like, it's like super fan, right? How about this family right here? It's subtle, it's, it's subtle, right? It's subtle, but you can look and figure it out, right? It's, it's like, it's, it, but people, if you walk into people's offices or homes, they'll decorate them with you go, oh, I know something you love. So here's a, here's a really subtle one. There's a person in this picture. If you look closer, you, you can find the person. This is a person who's a fan of some, something. Take a look. Next slide there. Can you imagine that yard, right? Now, look closely. The person, the person who owns that house is in the picture. Can you find him? Back by the door, between the, red, the, the yellow and the white door, there he is, all right? He's, so he's into it, okay? Now, I'm not recommending this kind of behavior. I'm just saying, and I'll, I'll give you one more. Guess what this woman is a fan of, what she really loves, what she's really into? Okay, so make that go away. That's a little creepy. But uh, some of you are like, that's my house. Um, but the point is this. When you look at a person, you can often recognize something about them. They're a fan of this. They love that. If someone is into music and you walk into their home, you see different, you know, little things. And you go, oh, that, they, they're into this. They're about this. Um, if you go into my refrigerator in my office here, you'll find like 12 kinds of salsa or hot sauce. You learn, you learn some, when you get into someone's life, you learn things about them. Here's my question. When someone watches your life, when they look at your, your home, your car, what's in your computer, what you spend your time doing, what shows up on your checkbook? What do you invest your time in? What you, you know, when someone looks at your life, do they, do they say, oh, she's one of Jesus' people. Oh, he loves Jesus. You can see. And I'm not saying you gotta wear signs all over the place. I'm just saying the way you live, the way you speak, the way you act, the way you think is shaped by Jesus. Because when you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, it transforms your life. So Jesus, this is our prayer. We pray that you would teach us more and more. Jesus, teach us more and more of what it means to love you with all that we have. Jesus, you have been so good. You are so glorious and so beautiful. You have provided, you have protected us. You have led us, you have called us your own for all of us who are Christians. You've taken our sins as far as the east is from the west. So Lord, may we love you more because we've been together today. More with our heart, more with our soul, more with our words, more with our mind, more with our energy and our strength and our creativity with all of our lives. Grow our love for you. And then we would dare to pray, looking forward to next week, that as we love you more and as we understand your love, we will overflow with that love to every person we meet. Thank you for this time to be together and to think about just this basic, simple truth that the most important thing we could ever do is to love you, oh God, with all that we are. Grow our love for you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Well, thank you. Uh, Before I I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give an invitation. Uh, Shoreline is a church in an area where people transition a lot and move out of the area. We have military folks that move on, people that come to school here that move on. Uh, We have people that just move on from job to job to different places. If you're moving out of the area, if you're part of Shoreline, you're moving out of the area in the next three to four months, we want to celebrate and bless you today. So Pastor Roy is going to be out right by the, uh, 
the pergola out there across from the gazebo there, uh, and, and he's gonna be there to greet you and give you a coin that reminds you to pray for Shoreline Church, and then Sherry, and after you talk with Pastor Roy, you'll come talk with Sherry and I. We wanna give you a book that'll encourage you to share your faith wherever God's sending you, and we wanna pray over you personally before you leave. And so if you're leaving in the coming months, <coughs> excuse me, if you're leaving in the coming months, please don't just disappear. But take a moment, come by there, and let us pray for you and send you off in the name of Jesus. So we'll be out there. If you need prayer, for anything, we have teams up front here that want to pray. On, we'll have folks ready to pray indoors, outdoors, in the, uh, outdoors if you're in the uh, courtyard or in the uh, parkside room. Just go by the big jumbotron screen at the side of the screen. Someone will be standing there to pray for you there. If you're online, uh, if you call right now, the number you see, there's someone waiting to answer the phone and pray with you. Or you can email your prayers to us and we'll put you on our prayer list. And if you're new, if you're new and online, just text the word welcome to the phone number you see there and we will reach out to you this week. If you're on campus, go by the Connection Center right there in the lobby as you come in, and they want to give you a little gift bag, and thank you for coming and answer your questions. So if you're able to stand, whether you're online or on campus, if you're able to stand, will you stand with me and give me the honor of sending you off with a word of blessing? As you go from this time together, may you go with a fresh perspective and understanding of the greatness of God's love for you. And may you then love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, all week long until we come back together again next Sunday. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you back here next Sunday.